Oh, but we talked at large before the 16 men were shot. But who can talk of give and take, what should be and what not, while those dead men are loitering there to stir the boiling pot? You say that we should still the land till Germany's overcome. But who is there to argue that now Pierce is deaf and dumb? And is there logic to outweigh McDonough's bony thumb? How could you dream they'd listen that have an ear alone for those new comrades they have found, Lord Edward and Wolf Tone? Or meddle with our give and take that converse bone to bone? That was another of W.B. Yeats's reflections on the 1916 Rising, a poem called 16 Dead Men. And the 16 dead men, the 16 leaders who were executed after the 1916 Rising, provided the momentum, the impetus behind a sea change in Ireland. The 1916 Rising now was the unstoppable moment in Irish politics. The Sinn Féin party, which was incorrectly blamed for the rebellion, now became the most popular party in the country. In 1916, it only had one branch in the entire country. Within a year, there were a thousand. Its membership became incredible. And the thing that changed everything was the execution of the leaders. George Bernard Shaw, another Irish Nobel laureate alongside W.B. Yeats, he recognised this and wrote a letter to the British press on the 10th of May 1916. My own view is that the men who were shot in cold blood after their capture or surrender were prisoners of war and that it was therefore entirely incorrect to slaughter them. I remain an Irishman and am bound to contradict any implication that I can regard as a traitor any Irishman taken in a fight for Irish independence against the British government, which was a fair fight in everything except the enormous odds my countrymen had to face. What's very interesting is that these words were echoed by John Dillon, the deputy leader of the Home Rule Party. He stood up in the British House of Commons to warn the British about what they were doing, the huge mistake they were making, to angrily criticise them for having made the worst mistake of recent years. And the rage that had built up, because he had been in Dublin for the fighting, he had observed it from his window in the Dublin city centre, and he had been shocked by the execution of the leaders. He warned the government, you are letting loose a river of blood, and make no mistake about it, between two races who, after 300 years of hatred and strife, we had nearly succeeded in bringing together. Is that nothing? It is the fruit of our life work. We have risked our lives a hundred times to bring about this result, and you are washing out our whole life work in a sea of blood. And that was exactly what was happening. It was more than his listeners could bear. But Dylan continued. Dylan, Dylan turned around in the House of Commons and he told them that he was not ashamed of these men. He was proud of them. He told the British that they would be lucky to have men like that fighting in the Somme, fighting in Flanders, fighting against the Germans, that they should have made these men their allies instead of making them their enemies. He said, I am not ashamed to say in the House of Commons that I am proud of these men. I say I am proud of their courage. And if you were not so obtuse and stupid, you could have had these men fighting for you. It is the insurgents who have fought a clean fight, a brave fight, however misguided. And it would have been a damned good thing for you if your soldiers were able to put as good a fight up as these men did in Dublin. 3,000 men against 20,000 with machine guns and artillery. So the execution of the leaders was a terrible mistake. The British government, though, probably did have no choice. It would have been lambasted in the British media if they had allowed the leaders to just rot in prison. An example would have to be made. This was needed in terms of British, British military war morale as much as anything else. But it proved devastating for Irish politics. A story was published shortly after this then 
which also touched Irish hearts. It was revealed that shortly before his death, James Connolly had asked to have his confession heard. He had seen the priest and he had received Holy Communion. And it was said that when Patrick Pierce had heard this story, he had said, thank God, that was the only thing I was anxious about. Vladimir Lenin reflected on the 1916 Rising in the years ahead. Following the success of the Russian Revolution in 1917, he said it was the great misfortune of the Irish to have risen up too soon, that if they had waited a few years, then the European revolt of the proletariat might have been able to come to their rescue. But whatever about that, what is clear is that the 1916 Rising wasn't so much a rebellion, it was street theatre. It was a drama played out on the streets of Dublin. It was self-consciously constructed in that way. And it's interesting when you look at how so many of the leaders had a background in the theatre, producing plays, performing plays, acting it out. They were acting out a grand drama, a grand drama to inspire a new generation of Irish leaders. Tim Healy, the man who had done so much to oppose Parnell and destroy him and his reputation. He dismissed the rising as the revolt of a minority of a minority, meaning that the rebels were a minority of the Irish volunteers who themselves were a minority of the Irish public. But in reality, it was a minority of a minority of a minority because the volunteers themselves were only a part of the IRB, who themselves were a minority there. This was an incredibly undemocratic thing, and that was to create problems for future generations, especially when troubles broke out in Northern Ireland in the late 1960s. Because if a rising had been against the will of the people in 1916, but retrospectively, retroactively regarded as a good thing and justified and vindicated, well, surely that gave you permission to rise up against the democratic majority at any other time, knowing that if you were successful or vindicated, people might change their mind and therefore you were allowed. And that made things very uncomfortable for some people in the years ahead. The best description of the 1916 Rising was that of Michael Collins. He said it had the air of a Greek tragedy. Afterwards, though, many of the rebels were sent to Frongok prison in Wales and some eventually released, some remained on in prison. But suddenly now there was an inescapable demand to support these revolutionaries. And it was decided that they should run some of these for Parliament. They decided to run Count Plunkett, the father of Joseph Mary Plunkett, for a seat in Roscommon. And Plunkett, who was a very cantankerous and difficult man, uh, eventually decided to go. Fortunately, he didn't go down to Roscommon until the day before the election, because I think if he had actually met the voters, he would have turned them off him. But his name alone, the name of Plunkett, this dead martyr, was enough to elect him. And then later in 1917, with a by-election in Longford, they hit upon an ingenious stroke they decided they would run one of the prisoners in jail, a man called Joseph McGuinness. And the slogan became, put him in to get him out, put him into the House of Commons to get him out of prison. But interestingly enough, many of the prisoners in jail, still in jail, hated this. They opposed it. Eamon de Valera, who was still in prison, got some very thin toilet paper and wrote a message on it, which he smuggled out of the prison to tell them, I disapprove of this action. I do not approve of this. You are playing dice with the names and legacy of the men of 1916. Now, why was de Valera and the other people so against this? Well, because they had been in prison for the change of mind of the Irish people. When they had headed off, when they had surrendered, they were used to being booed by the crowds. When they were being led away in chains, they were being jeered. When they headed off to England, they had the boos and, and jeers of the crowd echoing in their ears. 
In prison, they hadn't actually come to realise that popular opinion had changed. They didn't trust the Irish people. The Irish people had let them down in 1916 and they weren't prepared to forgive them. But those who had been released, people like Michael Collins, they had a different view. They saw that the Irish people were now with them and they decided that this was the way to do it. And so they decided, they eventually persuaded them, we will run McGuinness, we will run him in Longford. And Longford ran. And it was a big campaign. It was one of the most important campaigns in modern Irish electoral history. And it looked like McGuinness would be defeated. There was not enough support still yet for the revolutionaries. And then in the final days of, of the campaign, the local bishop came out in favour of McGuinness. And that turned things. And so when the count was done, they discovered that there was 37 votes in favour of McGuinness. And McGuinness was elected. Although a story that was told afterwards was that when the final tally of votes was done, McGuinness was behind. And one of the IRA members took out a revolver, pointed at the head of the returning officer and said, I think you made a mistake there. Count those votes again. And the terrified tally officer, returning officer, counted the votes again. And this time, fortunately for him, he found that McGuinness had won the seat by 37 votes. What that meant was that now suddenly it was clear that it was Sinn Féin that spoke for the Irish nationalist movement, that spoke for the cause and not the Home Rule Party. The Home Rule Party was nothing. It was destroyed. Redmond, broken-hearted, whose own brother Willie had died fighting in the Somme, he died too soon after this. And John Dillon took over the leadership of the party for a matter of months. And he led them into the 1918 election where they were effectively wiped out. They won six seats. Sinn Féin won 73. Uh, Home Rule Party, six, they had had previously 68. The Unionists gained seats. They went up from 18 to 26. Dillon himself lost his seat. And the Irish Home Rule Party was the final fatal casualty of the 1916 Rising. Because suddenly now there was a new movement. And Arthur Griffith, magnanimous, generous, he offered the leadership of the Sinn Féin Party over to Eamon de Valera. And Eamon de Valera accepted that. And now suddenly you had a new movement in Irish history. You had a mandate from the people. They had put in the Sinn Féin TDs, the MPs. And now they decided that they would set up their own parliament. That they would rule from London. That they would ignore British power in Ireland. And so the scene was set for the War of Independence.